Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 2G, where we're thinking about, finally, other causes of mutations than mistakes by DNA polymerase. We'll think about insertions of mobile elements that are a major cause of mutations, and we'll think of some of the consequences, and then we'll discuss changes to chromosomes, um, duplications and deletions, rearrangements, and changes in chromosome number. Now, we'll start with insertion of a mobile genetic element. And here I've shown the before and after of an insertion of a mobile element, what we call in earlier slides, we referred to as genetic parasite, into a gene. Now, these mobile elements can insert anywhere in the chromosome, but here I've drawn it inserting into a gene. And to give you a sense of how this works, I've made a little animation. So what happens is that a copy of the mobile element comes to the gene and cuts it and then inserts itself into the gene and seals itself into the gene so that now we have a continuous DNA strand, DNA double-stranded molecule, part of which is the original gene and part of which is the new sequence of the genetic parasite. Now, as I said, this can happen not only in genes. If it happens in a gene, it's likely to have very serious effects on the gene's function um, because it disrupts the coding sequence. Um, here I've shown insertions accumulating outside of genes. And one way to explain that would be to say that insertions also happen inside genes, but because they're usually destroying the gene's function, natural selection eliminates those mutations from the population. So we don't very often see insertions of mobile elements into genes, but we very often see them elsewhere in the genome. So this is evolutionary time. Initially, a few insertions, and then as time goes on, more insertions of different types of elements. Um, as you saw, the different colors in that pie chart represented different kinds of genetic parasites. And some of these genetic parasites are inserting into sequences that themselves were insertions of genetic parasites. So it's the little fleas have little fleas to bite them. Um, here's another one where an insertion of a genetic element has inserted inside another one. As time goes on and the genome evolves further, more and more of these elements accumulate. Now we've got pink ones piling up, pink ones inside other ones. The genome is getting bigger and bigger. It's not getting more genes, but it's getting bigger and bigger because it's getting more and more mobile genetic parasite sequences in it. In fact, these mobile genetic, a particular class of these genetic parasites, is thought to have been the original cause of introns, that they began as, whoops, back, sorry, back. They began as insertions of a particular type of genetic parasite into coding genes. And this type of parasite, because it was able to splice itself out of the RNA, didn't destroy the gene, wasn't eliminated by natural selection. And this is how introns are thought to have begun. So I've diagrammed one here. Here's another one where the intron genetic parasite has inserted, and then another genetic parasite is inserted inside the intron. So the introns themselves are also getting bigger because they are also sites where mobile genetic elements can insert into the genome without causing any harm to the function of the gene. Now, this leads us to thinking for a minute about, well, how big are genomes? What determines how big genomes are? So this is a graph that's on the x-axis. It has the size of the genome of many different organisms, um, viruses, bacteria and archaea, eukaryotes, um, the size of their genome, and the number of protein-coding genes. Now, we talked about RNAs a function of genes, but almost all genes in organisms are protein-coding genes. And what we see is that viruses have very small genomes, um, 
Some, most viruses, a few viruses are very large, but most have very small genomes, but they manage to squeeze in quite a lot of genes, like up here, for instance. Um, bacteria and archaea have very compact genomes. There's not much junk, not much mobile elements in their genomes, and their number of genes that they contain is quite nicely linearly a function of how big their genomes are. But the situation is very different for eukaryotes. Now we see a whole lot, wide range of genome sizes from less than ten, almost down to one megabase all the way up to 10,000 megabases. So that's three times as big as our genome. And very less dramatic, but still dramatic differences in number of protein coding genes. We, here's us, we're this yellow circle. We're actually pretty typical for animals. Our genes, our genomes have about 20,000 genes, maybe 30, depending on how you count, and we're about 3,000 megabases of DNA. And most of our genome is not genes. If most of our genome was genes, we'd be over here on the graph. So here's the question. Mobile elements are, have important consequences. As I said, usually the insertion of a mobile element will eliminate the function of the gene. And that's because if we, if we consider this gene, and for now let's just ignore this little regulatory sequence that I've drawn here. Just consider the normal gene, the blue gene, with its promoter ribosome binding site and start codon. Before the mobile element inserted, this gene encoded protein A. Now that the mobile element has inserted into it, it works in effect as a frame shift. This is a sequence that wasn't selected to be transcribed and translated from these sequences. And so when translation starts at this start, so it will be transcribed into a messenger RNA from its original promoter. But when translation starts from its original start codon, it's going to be translating sequences that are part of the mobile element. And chances are that the protein will A, be completely non-functional because these sequences were not evolved to act as proteins and will truncate prematurely because it'll need a start co stop codon. But in the case that I want you to consider, which is actually a fairly common case because many mobile elements contain regulatory signals themselves, I want you to consider the case where the mobile element itself carries a second set of regulatory signals. There's a promoter pointing out of the element, and there's a ribosome binding site and a start codon. And then that's followed by the rest of the blue gene, gene A. And what this question is asking you is, will the protein that's produced from this promoter, from this messenger RNA, will it resemble the normal protein A?